channel so today's case is actually a case that happened back in the 1990s 1996 to be specific it's still actually considered an ongoing case it's a missing persons case that happened in san luis obispo california there's actually new leads that could be happening now in 2020 which is actually really crazy this is why i decided to do this case because it's so it's just so crazy to think that something that happened back in 1996 could possibly be solved now. I really, really hope that they bring justice to this family and this girl that went missing. So the case is known as the Kristen Smart case. Kristen Smart was born in Germany to Stan and Denise Smart. She is the oldest of three, so she has a younger brother and a younger sister. In their early childhood, they actually moved from Germany to Stockton, California. Kristen um, ended up graduating high school and she went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. At the time, she was 19 years old. She was living in the dorms and her roommate was a girl named Crystal. This actually happened Memorial Day weekend, so it was a four-day weekend. Crystal actually decided to go out of town that Friday. Chris Kristen decided she wanted to go out. So before going out, she usually calls her parents every Sunday. She actually called them that Friday really quick just to let them know that she had good news about a grade in her class. They didn't answer and so she just left a voicemail. Well, come to find out this would be the last time they ever heard from Kristen. After she hung up with them, she decided she wanted to go out so she asked her friend from right across her room, this girl's name was Margarita, she asked her to go out with her so they were out trying to look for something to do. It was her, Margarita, and two other girls. So there's four of them all together. They got in this truck where th they actually knew this guy driving just to go drive around, go look for a party. At the time, Kristen did not have anything on her. She didn't have her money. She didn't have any identification. She actually didn't have an ID because she didn't like cars or driving. So she did not have an ID. Later on that night, they actually go to one party. It was really boring. They had one drink and they ended up leaving. They were driving around a little bit more and and Kristen and Margarita get dropped off near campus by the frats. Kristen's begging Margarita like let's go look for a party I really want to go do something let's go do something and Margarita just was not in the mood and the reason they actually had to stay together was because Kristen recently lost her key to get back into the dorms and so Margarita living in the same dorm brought her key with her and so they had to stay together in order to get back in later that night. Well at this time it was just Kristen and Margarita outside looking for a party to go to so this is where the two would split up margarita gave kristen her key because it was still early enough in the night for margarita to get back in without the key at this point kristen went searching for a party in the frats and margarita went back to her room kristen found a party it was actually a kind of a small frat party it was a birthday party for some guy she was hanging out drinking I don't know if she actually passed out outside or what happened there, but some people decided to walk her home, back to her dorm. So it was actually going to be Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis. So the two helped her up. They decided to walk her back to her dorm. And as they're walking, another guy comes up to come walk with them. And this guy's name is Paul Flores. So now it's the four of them walking Kristen. During their walk, Tim Davis decides, you know what, you guys can walk her back. He lives off campus, so he drove to the party, so he's gonna go to his car and drive home. So he leaves them to walk Kristen back to her room. The walk is probably about like 11 minutes after Tim leaves. Cheryl's like, okay, this is my dorm, I'm gonna go. So she leaves Paul to walk Kristen back to her dorm. In Paul's account, he says that his dorm was closer than hers. Now at this point, remember I said they helped her up to walk her back. She is so drunk, she can't even stand up on her own, hardly. Paul's account is that he decided to let Kristen walk back to her dorm alone and he go to his. Well, how is that gonna happen if she was barely able to even stand up? Obviously, Paul was the last person to see her, so he is a person of interest. He's a suspect, actually. Another thing I do want to mention is that this case has never been considered a cold case. So a cold case is declared when the police actually have exhausted all of their leads, which in this case they actually have not. It is not a cold case, it's an ongoing case that they're still investigating. 
So Saturday rolls around and Kristen's roommate Crystal actually comes back to her dorm. When she walks in, she notices that Kristen actually has all her stuff laid out on her bed, just like the day before when she had left, which she wasn't too concerned about. It just let her know that, hey, Kristen didn't stay there last night, which, okay, cool. Come Saturday night, Kristen is still not in her room and Crystal's actually getting kind of concerned like what is going on? Where is she? Why is she not coming back? I believe Sunday she ends up going and asking people because she still hasn't seen from seen her or heard from her She goes and asks some of her friends like hey, have you seen Kristen? Where is she? Nobody knows where she is. Nobody have seen her since Friday night since the party Margarita still hasn't gotten her key back. Margarita hasn't seen her so they're getting kind of concerned. Monday, Crystal decides to get some girls together. They're gonna call the campus police to let them know that they have not seen Kristen since Friday night at the party, even before the party when Crystal saw her. And they're really concerned. They don't know where she is. She's been missing. So they call campus police. They just kind of shrug it off. They're like, okay, well, I mean, it's a four day weekend. It's Memorial Day, like she probably just went on vacation. So they did not take a report at all. And this is Monday. They were not happy with that answer. So they called the police department. The police department didn't do anything either. They said, well, you need to call your campus police. They're literally giving them such a runaround, trying to report her missing and they're just like disregarding it. Like what? They call campus police back. They tell them like she has been missing for more than 24 hours. Like it's been a long time. Nobody's seen her. We're concerned. They finally do a report Tuesday, May 28th, four days after she was missing. Four days. So the police end up interviewing the three people that walked Kristen back to her dorm. During this interview, they automatically already have a suspect and the suspect is Paul. So at the time, Paul is a freshman in college, just like Kristen. His parents live 15 minutes away from Cal Poly in Arroyo Grande. Growing up, Paul was considered really odd, weird, and creepy. Girls were just scared of him and he would just give off like really weird and like bad vibes. No one wanted to be alone with him and there was multiple accounts of him trying to take advantage of girls. He was like aggressively flirty with them. That's really weird. During the interview, police actually ask Cheryl about Paul and Cheryl knows about Paul. She knew about him before the party. She actually tells them that her and her friends have a nickname for Paul and his nickname is Chester the Molester. Apparently Paul actually tried to take advantage of one of her friends previously and he kissed her. He just kind of threw himself on her and tried kissing her and it, she was weirded out by it. Like that's, that's not okay. They end up asking Tim about Paul and he recalls that during the party he actually heard this loud bang noise and when he looked over he saw Kristen fell on the floor and while she was on the floor, Paul just kind of threw himself on top of her. I don't know. That's really weird. And this is the reason why Paul is the number one suspect at this point. Another reason is because Paul actually had a few run-ins with the police already. He was caught while in college peeping into this girl's room. She saw him, she called the cops. And then a few months later, I think it was in March, February or March, he actually was pulled over and he was driving under the influence. So he got his driver's license suspended. During this time, he was actually driving with a suspended license. He got pulled over again and they actually wanted him to show up in court. He never showed up in court. They actually got a warrant for his arrest. This warrant was May 27th, so just two days after Kristen went missing. They take Paul in and they take his picture. He has a mug shot and everything and it's noticed that Paul has a black eye. And remember, this is two days after Kristen went missing. So he has a black eye. They don't know anything about the Kristen disappearance yet because obviously they haven't taken the report until the 28th, I believe it was. So the next day they'll take that report on Kristen. So they don't know any correlation between the two right now, but that mugshot comes in handy. The Cal Poly police finally interview Paul on the 30th. It was noted that during his interview, he actually had scratches on the backs of his hands, on his arms, and on his knees. They see that mugshot from the 27th and realize that he had a black eye. He was then questioned about it and Paul said that he got his black eye on Sunday when he was playing basketball with a friend named Jeremy. So they end up interviewing Jeremy and Jeremy was like, no, 
we, he did not get that black eye on Sunday. He actually already had that black eye and I remember this very specifically because I asked him about it too. And he said that Paul told him he doesn't even know how he got the black eye. So there's just already some inconsistencies with this story. Come June 19th, Paul was finally interviewed again about his inconsistencies in his story. He then changed his story and he said that he got the black eye Monday morning at 2 a.m. Now remember, Jeremy saw the black eye on Sunday. So he said he got the black eye Monday at 2 a.m. when he was trying to clean up his car. He was trying to take the radio out. And as he was doing that, he hit his eye on the steering wheel. Now, I don't know, that's, that's just a little weird. I don't know how you're gonna do that by taking a radio out, like maybe saying like, yeah, the radio hit you in the face. That would make more sense. But how are you gonna take the radio out and hit your head on the steering wheel? I don't know, it's just, it's weird. He admitted to lying to the police about that. And the reason he said he lied was because he said it wasn't a big deal. Well, I mean, it kind of is a big deal. There's a missing person here. Towards the end of this interview, Paul actually asked the police if he can leave early because he has something to do. When they're questioning him, they're like, what do you have to do? Like, what, what is so important that you have to leave? He's like, well, I have to go to my mom's house and help clean up concrete. Now that's gonna be a huge part of the story. He admits that he had to go to his mom's house to go help clean up concrete. Police then end up wanting to go and search Paul's dorm. Well, the thing is school's over. So Paul had already moved out of this dorm and the school had the rooms clean. While they still brought search dogs to go and check out the room, they actually, the dogs were alerted to Paul's mattress. The dogs can smell a decomposing body and the scent of chemicals. So they alerted to that, which is a huge red flag. They also interviewed Paul's roommate who lived in the same dorm as Paul. This guy's name was Daniel. When police interviewed Daniel, Daniel actually said that he was out of town that weekend and Paul had the entire room to himself all weekend. He even mentioned that Paul told him a completely different story of that night. He said that he walked Kristen all the way back to her dorm, the entrance, and let her walk inside and he ended up walking back to his dorm alone. So it's now been two months since Kristen went missing. The police department finally gets a search warrant to search the Flores home. When they go, it's a super quick search. Honestly, it's a it, it's very lazy. It's a very lazy search. They don't bring search dogs, even though it was previously known that there was a decomposing body on his mattress at the college in his dorm. They don't bring search dogs. They don't bring a forensics team or anything. During the search, it actually ends up being found that there are two news articles about Kristen missing but the location of these articles is very weird so one of them was actually hiding underneath paul's mattress and the second one was hiding under reuben's mattress and reuben is paul's father so he also was joking with daniel telling him that yeah i took kristen back to my mom's house and they were hanging out together that's just really weird why is he telling two different stories why is he telling daniel these things and then telling the police something else and why are they cleaning up concrete at his mom's house after they searched the flora's home what they didn't do was they didn't search paul's mother's home susan susan lived in another house she actually lived in her rental property because her and Reuben were filing divorce, they weren't going to be together, or separation, something like that. But she was living in her rental property at the time, and this is where they were cleaning up that concrete. The police didn't realize that she wasn't living there, so they never searched her house. So Susan ends up moving out of this rental property and into another place so that she can finally rent out this house. Eventually, she finds a couple to rent out this property from her. They actually have no idea about the relationship between the Kristen Smart case and the Flores family. After they move in, they actually get postcards from people that lived in the area and also people that lived in Stockton from where Kristen grew up. They were getting postcards saying that they need to work with the police to figure out this case. You need to turn your son in and all this stuff. They didn't understand what these men or what was going on. So they just kept the postcards and put them in like a safe place just in case. They just assumed it was from previous residents. They were told when they moved in that there was this like tin 
like metal trash can on the property. They were told not to use it, not to touch it, leave it alone because it's actually gonna be picked up in the next couple of days by Ruben. So they were like, okay, that's weird, but sure, whatever. They just leave it alone. One day, the lady that lived there, she went to go wash her car and as she was washing her car, she saw something shiny in the corner of her eye kind of near the trash can. When looking closer at it, she realized that she found an earring. She picked it up and she was looking at it and it ended up being a really small shiny earring. It had like turquoise teardrop, I think it was on it. On the back of it, there was actually like a dark reddish smudge with like a slight fingerprint on it. She took the earring, put it in a um, plastic bag and put it with the postcards. I'm not really sure how this happened, but a detective coming and interviewing them, they gave this detective the earring that they had in this plastic bag. He took it with them while a little while later, like years down the line, it ended up being that earring went missing while it was in police custody. There is no evidence of what color it was, where it went. They can't even relate it back to Kristen. However, the family that found it, they actually ended up realizing the relationship between the Flores family and Kristen Smart. And there was actually a billboard near their house of a picture of Kristen and her like it's saying missing Kristen Smart and like a picture of her and she was actually wearing like this necklace that was very very similar to this earring they were like a matching set that's really concerning another thing I want to mention was after they moved in they would end up hearing they said 4 20 in the morning beeping and it sounded like beeping coming from a watch and they would wake up and the beeping was coming from the backyard so they would go and search the backyard look in the flower bed they knew it was coming from under the cement though in the backyard. Eventually the beeping stopped and that was cause if it was a watch or whatever it was, it died. It was also said that Kristen was a new employee at like a pool. She was a lifeguard on duty. Since she was new, she actually wanted as many hours as she could get. And the hours that were available were early mornings, like five or six in the morning. Her mom recalls Kristen telling her sometimes like, yeah, I gotta go to bed early cause I gotta wake up at around 4.30 to get to work on time. I don't know. That's just either a weird coincidence or something is really off here. So the police were finally able to search the house that Susan had as a rental property while these new tenants were in because they let the police go and search. However, the search didn't really bring anything up. They did, however, bring in a guy to do some ground penetrating radar to see if there was any evidence of a body underneath the ground. However, this guy hadn't really been able to search for a body before so he didn't really know what to look for exactly but he did find some stuff it was never said if there was a body there or not he couldn't determine that would kind of conclude the search there on may 25th 2002 kristen smart was legally presumed dead since that time paul had never been charged with anything and he, i believe he's now 43 years old he actually lives in los angeles california since this case is still ongoing they were actually able to get multiple warrants they actually found more evidence they processed new and old evidence to see if there's anything they can find but they were recently able to get some search warrants and they obtained two trucks that belonged to the Flores family back in 1996. They're doing some investigating on that now. On April 22nd, 2020, they got a search warrant to search Paul Flores' home in Los Angeles. They detained him during the search. All it says is that they were able to find some items of interest. They also served a search warrant to Susan at her home in Royal Grande. So they looked there, they obtained a computer, brown paper bag full of stuff, a couple other things, and they're actually actively searching to see if they can find anything. If they do end up ever looking under the concrete, I don't believe they're gonna find Kristen's body. They are probably gonna be moving that body, especially since they know all this information now and all this information is out there and the beeping of a watch and her body is not there anymore. I don't know where it is. I really hope they are able to get Paul because all evidence points to him. This is just such a sad case and I really, really hope they're able to get him, at least get some sort of peace. I don't know if they will ever be able to find Kristen's body. I guess time will just tell. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Before you leave, please press that subscribe button. I would really, really appreciate it. Also, give this video a thumbs up if you like it. If there is any updates with this case, if anything is 
found out, I will be doing an update video and I'm really hoping there is and I'm sure there will be. So I will see you guys next time. Bye.